so hello, thank you, Andrew, that was awesome. Um, so we're gonna move uh, a little bit to a different type of story that has a lot of the same uh, similarities, but not quite the same outcome. Now I will just let you all know, just in case this story does have a happy ending, and no data were harmed in the making of this story. <laughs> so um, if you had some qualms, put them at rest. It, uh, it's all good. I'm Bradley Daigle, I'm executive director of AP Trust. And, and I'm, Jill, uh, I'm Jill Sexton. I'm Associate Director for Digital and Organizational Strategy at North Carolina State University Libraries. And so we're going to tag team a story about um, digital preservation. So it's incumbent upon me to remind everyone uh, that digital preservation has many components. And these are some of the key pieces that uh, don't really play a, a singular role. They play a collective role in the outcome of this story but elements that are critical to um, not having an unhappy ending for, um, you know, not if data loss happens, but when data loss happens at our individual organizations. And basically things for an organization to always make sure that they have in due course, which is uh, these elements, strategic framework, um, understanding that digital preservation, of course, is um, active. And as many of you have heard me say before, I strongly believe that digital preservation is an asymptote. It's something that you approach but never really get to, and that's okay. It's about the journey. Um, if you feel like you've solved digital preservation, please stand up and let's all exit the room accordingly and follow you to your organizational home. Um, the second part is digital preservation is about assurance, and this is where this key component comes into this conversation, and assurance comes in many ways. Um, and I can tell you, based on the uh, story that we've heard earlier from my colleagues, uh, Karen and Rosalind, assurance is not an MOU. It does not come from a board. It does not come from any kind of documentation that is uh, an NDA. Assurance is a dialogue and relationship between and among players in digital preservation, both in your organization and the services with whom you engage. Specifically for, from an AP Trust perspective, is uh, this concept of fire drills. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about AP Trust in the next slide very briefly. But the idea of fire drills, and if some of you went to, um, there, there's a blog post that I put on the DPC, but essentially a fire drill is something that I developed with AP Trust, which is the means by which we can test an organization's resilience. So for example, AP Trust as a service will, um, we have a methodology by which we will randomly, randomly restore content that you've deposited in our service. And we do that for two reasons. Um, one reason is that we want to make sure that you, in the case of a catastrophe, are able to make sense of that which you put in originally. So it's testing our service's ability to deliver what you expect. The second part of that, and the equally important part, is that assurance also tests your organization's ability to understand what you get back internally. So not only are you assured in these instances that the service is doing what you expect, you're also assured that your organization is able to understand how it's using digital preservation and where it fits. So that's a key, a key piece for digital preservation that constantly needs to be assessed and tested. Not all of our members love that idea. Um, sometimes it's inconvenient, um, but as the story will tell you, that doesn't always fit with our plans. So quick, quick take on AP Trust. So AP Trust, we're a small consortium of what I would consider um, fiery and deeply engaged individuals who uh, are passionate about digital preservation, um, are very, I would say, self-deprecatory about their ability to do digital preservation, but also have a very strong desire to figure out our common problems around digital preservation. We've been around for a while. Um, we have, um, I don't have a number slide like Andrew's impressive numbers, but I can tell you off the top of my head, we have roughly 10.2 million items. Uh, we have conducted, uh, it's about 192 million events, premise events that we've logged um, with our depositors content. So we have a fair number of um, things going on. And of course, we're dedicated to transparency. Thanks for the shout out uh, from Rosalind earlier. All of our documentation is publicly available off our wiki and website, so um, you can see it all there. That's AP Trust. Okay, so I'm gonna start talking a little bit about uh, NC State in our context, and I, um, I thought it would be 
interesting to kind of give a little bit of um, a little bit of my perspective. So listening to Andrew's talk earlier, Andrew spoke for uh, on the perspective of Harvard, a very well resourced um, institution, um, and it's a really impressive infrastructure you've got. You've got you know an order of magnitude more content than we than we've got at NC State. Nevertheless, you know NC State I think is is fairly fortunate and well resourced for an institution of our size, um, but you know not quite the same level as Harvard. <laughs> um, um, but we do still feel that we've got a, a strong need for robust digital preservation infrastructure. Our special collections program is relatively young in the scale of, of special collections programs, but it's a growing program. Um, and many of our collecting areas have a healthy um, uh, born digital component to them. So it's really important to us that we keep those uh, precious born digital materials especially safe. Um, and I think, you know, and going to talk about why we chose AP Trust as our digital preservation infrastructure, I just think it's important to understand like what made us make that decision. So in 2019, uh, the li our libraries did all of our digital preservation um, work in-house. So not only did we create workflow applications, our storage infrastructure we hosted ourselves, um, and we did have an offsite tape back to, uh, tape backup that we maintained um, uh, you know, our, ourselves as well. Um, but we uh, thought it was time for us to kind of take a look at what we were doing and make a decision about whether that was the best way for us to go forward in the future. Um, some of the factors at play here, um, there were some changes in the digital preservation environment at that time. So NC State was an early investor in both AP Trust and Deepin. This was around the time that Deepin folded and, um, and it made us kind of step back and think, you know, okay, so what are our current investments? What are we doing? How are we approaching this problem? Um, you know, we were buying into AP Trust, but at the time we really hadn't really committed to using it as our digital preservation platform. We were like, oh, well, we're doing this in-house. You know, we're just, we're, we're, we're look, taking a look at AP Trust. We're going to see if it, you know, how it does. Um, we're still dating. Yeah, we're just, yeah, we're just casual. Um, and, um, uh, but you know, we also decided we, it was time for us to kind of take a look at our investment portfolio. We're paying dues into this organization. We're spending time going to the meetings. We're not buying into it. Do we believe in it or not? Do we think it's important to invest in shared infrastructure? If so, if, if we think it's a, it's a good and it's a reliable platform, why aren't we using it? Um, so we, we kind of undertook this exploration with a mind of saying, well, either we're gonna go all in, we're gonna use this as our digital preservation platform, or we're gonna disinvest. Um, if, if we don't think that it's worth it, why are we paying into it, right? Um, you know, there are a variety of other factors at play. You know, cloud storage was getting cheaper and cheaper all the time. Um, uh, and, and also, we were in the midst of kind of doing some long, long vision thinking, doing a really frank assessment of, um, of our own staffing levels, a recognition that our institution might not be as well served by uh, trying to maintain and develop our own infrastructure for this really critical component when we, you know, we were well resourced, but not that well resourced. Um, we had a lack, uh, we didn't have a real depth of expertise in, um, in our pool. We have people who are good, individual people who are really strong in their work functions, but really no redundancy. Um, so that creates a single point of failure, which is really risky when you have, are thinking about long-term digital preservation. Um, we didn't. We know we're not going to get any more staff, money to pay for more staff to bring in to provide that redundancy and extra depth of expertise, um, and and just a, as an institution historically, NC State puts more of an emphasis on using those resources to develop applications, uh, you know, workflow tools, et cetera, that can really bring an advantage that we couldn't purchase elsewhere, um, and then paying for services that like infrastructure that we can that we can buy. Um, that we can't do better ourselves. Um, so um, you can you can pretty pretty much guess you know <laughs> well I, I, I'm I'm skipping a little bit like um, so to give you a sense of the scale of our of our program in 2019 we had about 60 terabytes of uh, of what we be, we would consider um, irreplaceable data um, and um, with an anticipated growth rate of about 10 terabytes per year. So, you know, you can see a, an order of magnitude different from Harvard, um, but still very important to us. Um, and so, you know, in and looking at a variety of options, we had a really great team who's listed on one of my next 
uh, one of my next slides. Um, I don't want to take credit for their work. They did a great job creating a really exhaustive review of digital preservation environment, calculating long-term costs of you know, doing it in-house versus various different platforms. Um, and um, they looked at, a, at a, a, a matrix of factors that they considered and added up and tallied up as to come up with like a score of like, these are the platforms that we think would be acceptable and here's how we should um, move ahead. And you can see kind of you know, typical risk mitigation um, uh, um, points here on the slide that they considered in making their decision. Uh, and when it, when it all came out, we, we decided that AP Trust was our best bet um, for a variety of factors. Um, you know, we um, also were, had a lot of confidence in, in the organization and its financial model, um, you know, in, in the leadership uh, of, of AP Trust. And so we thought it was the best way for us to go more moving ahead. And so um, maybe this is what you all came to hear about, <laughs> but... Um, you know, we talk a lot as institutions about our, our shining moments and our big, you know, really exciting uh, achievements and accomplishments. Look at this great thing we did, and we very rarely talk about, like, wow, we really messed up. Well, we made a big mistake. <laughs> um, and um, in June 2021, we had um, one of those risk factors that we, that we deliberately planned for, um, staff, an accidental staff uh, error. Um, happened, and the storage the, the storage volume that held really all of our digital preservation masters for special collections was accidentally deleted, and its backup immediately deleted. <laughs> um, and so that was I don't know, like let it sink in. Like imagine if that happened to you in your library, that was a bad day. It was a bad day, um, um, but. A year before, we had we a, a, a team of dedicated folks had worked to um, start ingesting all of our special collections content into AP Trust, and it was all there. It was all there, <laughs> um, and so wow, what a great thing! So, like, first thing we did was was call Bradley. <laughs> um, uh, you know, well, probably not the first thing, like the first, <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> uh, uh, but, you know, one of the first things that we did. And um, uh, through the course of, uh, of, of investigating the incident and, and um, seeing what we had on, on other backup sources, we were able to determine that all but 16 terabytes of that, we, we were able to recover from local data stores. Um, and we ha ended up having about 16 terabytes worth of irreplaceable uh, digital special collections content that we needed to recover from AP Trust. I'm not going to go into a great level of detail about the recovery process, but if you have specific questions, you can ask. Um, and probably might be more instructive for you to be in touch directly with the technical folks who, who worked on this recovery effort if you have more specific questions. But um, it took us about six weeks to complete the restore pro process. Um, and um, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, what we did to mitigate uh, root cause. Um, but, you know, all of the things that result, you know, you think that your practices are good. Um, you know, you do your best. You make a good effort to create thorough documentation, to create strong change management protocols, um, to, um, you know, not delete precious storage volumes that contain um, your, your precious uh, digital masters. Um, but you never, you know, we're all vulnerable. Um, I think the point of this, this whole talk is no matter how well uh, prepared you think you are, accidents can happen, disasters can happen, um, and um, it's good to be prepared. <laughs> so, um, so of the things that, that happened, the things that went well, we were able to recover everything. We didn't lose anything, um, which I think is really a credit to uh, the strong work of, um, uh, of Bradley and his team uh, at AP Trust, as well as the uh, dedicated work of numerous staff in the libraries through, throughout essentially an entire summer um, uh, uh, to, to extensively kind of document what, what had been present, what, uh, what we needed to recover, and ensure that it was all recovered properly. Um, costs were contained, and I think Bradley might be uh, uh, going to talk a little bit more about that, but um, his team worked really closely with Amazon to determine the rate at which we could um, 
download content without uh, incurring egress charges. And also, NC State is an Internet 2 member, and our deal with AWS meant that we, we were shielded and buffered from some uh, uh, AWS egress fees for um, recovering our data. I think uh, a great strength of the, uh, throughout the entire process is, um, you know, this is a really high stress uh, incident for us at NC State, but I have to give credit to the team. No one lost their temper. No one pointed fingers. This was an accident, um, and it's unfortunate, but accidents happen, and it doesn't do good to make people to, to blame, to shame people. <laughs> um, and I think that we had very uh, clear, level-headed communication throughout. I think, you know, Mike Kostelik at, at, in, in the libraries at NC State, uh, Trevor Thornton, Brian Dietz, uh, Kevin Beswick, Jason Ronaldo, they're, they're Jamie Bradway, listed on the, on the slide here, um, just acted extremely professionally. I think that is such a critical um, part of why we were able to get through this disaster, still talking to each other, still friends, you know, still trusting each other uh, and trusting in, in the capabilities of, um, of every group to do what's required to, um, to maintain our collections safely. Um, and um, uh, it, with AB Trust help, we completed a really thorough after action review of the incident to, to you know, document exactly what happened and to the best of our ability to um, create actions and, and um, follow up on those uh, plans uh, to do what needs to be done to prevent future incidents from happening. Um, I think one of the things that could have gone better, um, you know, just as Bradley mentioned, everybody, uh, I guess you always think, well, I'll, do, I'll get to that fire drill. I'll, I'll test this out later. Well, you know, we'll get there. We'll test it out one day. Um, we hadn't done any really fire, fire drills um, testing um, kind of massive data recovery efforts. And that slowed us down initially. Um, we didn't really, everything, all the knowledge we had was theoretical about how we might recover things. It wasn't practice. And we hadn't documented any of the methods, policies, or roles that were going to be required to make this uh, a success. So I really can't emphasize enough that it's really important for you to, um, to do that test, to practice, to document and define roles um, before you need to do it, because it just, what in the midst of a crisis you are not thinking as clearly as uh, as you could be, and it's it's just good to have a starting point. Uh, Bradley, so I'm thinking we should have called this talk more something along the lines of um, Jill and the horrible, terrible, no good day, um, <laughs> but we went with data loss. Yeah. Again, uh, but from from a service perspective, I think you're you're hearing a lot of of things that could have been done better, things that were done well. And I really want to focus on the, the learning strategies that have evolved from this. So for example, because AP Trust had been doing those fire drills, we had a pretty good sense of how to pull data out, um, even from Glacier Deep Archive. So this was, for those of you who know your cloud storage tiers, this was like the worst case cost scenario. It was across multiple um, data centers in the far region, using a Glacier service of Amazon, which basically means that they're just sitting there and they've got that meter on you know, speed. Uh, but because we are constantly interacting with the data and pulling things down for fixity, we had um, kind of microservices in place to be able to know exactly what threshold we could withdraw data to not incur costs. And in fact, at the end of the day, the threshold wound up being human, not technological, mm -hmm. because giving you know, NC State uh, 16 terabytes of data and be like, hey, is it, is it all good? Let us know, because uh, we need to delete it off this other you know, mid-tier storage, it was not a good solution. It was about what's the right balance, how much can an organization physically evaluate for their materials knowing that the stakes are very high. So we had to look at the cost factors, um, and of course, uh, Brian Dietz, a special collections, um, Individual was very concerned about, you know, that of course would be the one time that faculty want all these high resolution images that they requested mm -hmm. years ago. They're like, where's my scans? So we had to find all the right balance points. Mm -hmm. um, the other piece was, as I told my staff, I'm like, well, gosh, if this doesn't go well, then we might as well just all go home because that's the story that people would tell. Um, and it's the story that people kind of want to hear instead of the happy ending story. Um, 
just for a variety Speak of reasons. Speak for yourself. I know. Yeah. <laughs> but in terms of like, wow, thank God that wasn't us um, <laughs> yeah. in terms of that. But one of the other pieces is we did, AP Trust does happen to have a staff member who has a certification in risk mitigation. And so she did sit down with the NC State uh, folks and say, okay, let's walk through this postmortem. Here's how you do an incident reporting. And then here's how you, more importantly, turn that into organizational change and advocacy strategies for where you're seeing those gaps. And I think that was a critical piece for how does, um, you know, this kind of relationship move forward in that regard and learning from this as, you know, we have so many things and then sharing the story. You know, the last piece I'll tell you is I, I have to give, um, you know, Greg and Jill, Greg Roschke, the, the dean there, so much credit for being willing and open to tell this story. Because I feel like the digital preservation community is much like the special com collections community was, you know, 25, 50 years ago, where if you had a theft, you know, no one said anything. Like, you know, don't say anything. If the donors hear that someone stole something, then you know it's going to look bad. We'll never get we'll never get any more funding. Um, just don't say anything. Whereas at some point they realize, well, if we don't say anything, then we're never going to learn and we're never going to get this stuff back. I think digital preservation is very similarly disposed. Whereas if we don't tell as many stories about um, where data loss has happened and what we've done to mitigate and solve for that in the future, other organizations won't learn until it's their turn. So it's really incumbent upon us to be mindful and, I would say, objective about these stories to say, yeah, it's going to happen to us, or it has happened to us, and how do we learn together as a community and move forward? So that's what I'm looking at as the outcomes to this story. Yes, I'm glad that it, it went very well. We had 100% successful you know, restore, but more importantly, I'm glad we're able to tell this story um, so that you all can hear it. Yeah, so um, to sum up, and in response to the list of uh, mitigation factors that we identified during the postmortem, um, we've put the following um, practices into place, you know, um, really made sure that all of our documentation is accurate. We have worked to script real-time dependency identification, so to be sure if something goes offline that some system depends on, um, we hear about it with effective monitoring and alerting um, uh, that wasn't in place previously. Um, we have greatly enhanced our change management procedures, instituting a change management process that is mandatory um, across our development groups um, so that there are templates of questions that, are, um, that must be answered, reviewed by the relevant development team, and approved before any change of, this, you know, of, of any significant magnitude can be, um, can be enacted. Um, we have instituted more intentional knowledge sharing um, of, uh, across, of, of you know, to try to mitigate that effect of, um, well, this person is the expert on this system, and if they're not here, then we really can't, we'll just have to wait till they get back from vacation or we, they're back from the sick leave before we uh, can do anything about that. We've really tried to, um, uh, to make an intentional effort to um, cross-train. Um, and I think um, maybe most significantly, um, it really kick-started a conversation that had already begun um, and that I alluded to previously, um, knowing that we have, you know, actually staff retirements coming up. Um, we're all subject to staff turnover, especially now. Um, just really assessing our, our strengths as an organization, our capacity uh, in our staffing expertise and our staffing levels, um, and making um, an informed decision about how our infrastructure should evolve in the future. Uh, to really provide the most stable and sustainable um, solution and platform for NC State. Um, and so, um, you know, just just underscored to us the importance of um, outsourcing in areas where we can't um, do as well as an organization that that is devoted to that purpose. So, you know, physical hardware maintenance, you know, storage infrastructure is one. You know, we have are, are disinvesting, I think, in local, like, self-maintained, um, um, hardware in favor of uh, outsourcing to our central IT office, for example, or, or relevant cloud services when, when, it, when available. And another example is, um, is AP Trust for digital preservation infrastructure. I think, you know, Simeon mentioned um, in his lightning talk yesterday, um, shared infrastructure equals shared distribution of effort, a better product, and a, and a product that's less susceptible to oversight. I think that's roughly what he said. I wrote it down because I was like, yes, I, I agree. Um, and so, 
Um, that's the upshot. I think um, it was a learning experience for us, thankfully one that we were able to recover from. Um, it, we did lose a summer worth of effort from some of our uh, you know, really talented, skilled staff. They could have been working on something else. Instead, they were working on recovering work that had already been done. But um, you know, it, was, it was a valuable experience for us. And um, I, I think leave it open to any questions you might have. And I don't know, did you have sure more? Oh, here's the team, yes. Um, thank you so much, team. Um, that's it. So. I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. I wanted to thank you, Jill, because it's not easy to stand up in front of a large room of people and say, we made a mistake. That's why but I'm I sitting. think it's... <laughs> But it's really helpful, I think, for all of us to know that when we do make a mistake, we're not alone, um, and that we can all learn from our mistakes. So thank you. So in sharing on problems that happened, <laughs> we had a journal file system fail, and we'd had someone make the decision that they didn't need to move that information to AP Trust as quickly. And so we had to scramble locally and had to actually re-image a small amount of stuff. So that leads me to um, knowing how hard it was to sort through what we could find in different places and what we had to re-digitize. I wondered, did you ever consider just pulling the whole 35 terabytes from AP Trust rather than trying to recover out of local resources? There was conversation around it, but the, the level of confidence on what they were able to resurrect from local storage was high enough that they felt that it was a, a safe bet. I should mention uh, that we have made significant investment into digital preservation and just workflow tools um, it with, at, at North Carolina State. So Trevor Thornton and Brian Dietz, I think, have worked really closely on a tool um, they call Scoops. I think it's called Special Collections Preservation System Scoops, SCPS. Mm -hmm. um, um, and so we had really great records of what we had what we had deposited um, and what it was, and, you know. So we, we did have a high degree of confidence and didn't feel it was necessary to just pull everything. Plus, it would have taken much longer, a lot more effort. A, a lot of staff time went into this. I, I don't want to minimize that. It was significant, lot, uh, you know, unexpected commitment of staff time. Um, and to have more than doubled it would have been, we didn't need to. I think to Andrew's point earlier as well, which I, of course, always enjoy um, when Andrew speaks, is he's right. There's, we're, there's a, we're a smart bunch. There's a lot of really smart people here. There's no reason why we shouldn't be solving these problems together. Um, and even if you are a well-resourced organization or you think you're a well-resourced or you think you could be better resourced, there's always room for collaboration. There's always room for information sharing. And I think it's more of the behavioral cultural limitations that m minimize the amount of preservation that could happen. And if we could think more about how we meet each other where we're at from a digital preservation perspective, I think we'll find that more digital preservation will happen as a result. And that's why I think coming to these meetings and listening to different perspectives is always a refreshing um, way to do that. So I certainly don't think our service is the be-all and end-all, and we're very clear about what we do. Um, and that's why we focus more on the community that we develop. So all the pieces that Jill talked about, we've learned just as much from them as they may have from what AP Trust is working on. And that's really the key point, whether you're an AP Trust member or not. It's like, what do you bring to the table? So I like to just remind us that that's kind of why we're all here, right? Wholeheartedly agree. Um, I'll also mention that uh, Mike Kaselik, who is one of the leads uh, in this project, 
uh, at NC State will be giving a presentation, I think probably with a more technical uh, bent on the, um, on the recovery process at Code for Lib um, coming up. I can't even remember, is it in Philly? I can't remember where it is. Um, Princeton, okay. Uh, so he'll be giving a talk on this. If you, if any, you want to send your folks to hear him talk at Code for Lib, you know, he's, he'll be addressing it there, and you can speak with him directly as well. All right. No way, we're not done. We're all going to sit here quietly until <laughs> 2 o'clock. Josh, did you have a question? I had a question. Oh, Josh, sorry. See? You can come up and ask us. Come on up, Josh. A question Josh. for Andrew. Okay. Andrew, you had a blue biscuit on one of your slides. It was DRM management tool. Could you just briefly describe what that is? The blue biscuit? <laughs> oh, God. So I think the biscuit to which you are referring oh, shoot, shoot. Um, was actually the, the DRS management, uh, which basically just sort of generally speaking, like the DRS software. Uh, oh, uh, there's a database. In, yeah, there's a database that's in there for sure. This is the biscuit. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, it's like the... The, what, what's right now is a bespoke system that includes caching and database and a lot of custom software. Yep. All right, now you can go. 